I'm going to always uh, call on someone, and I'd actually call on the chief that he doesn't know I'm going to call on him. But um, how old will you be when you die? Oh, oh, very. Well, how old? <laughs> Give me an age. Uh, 100. 100. And um, do you know what the average life expectancy, now you're not 65, but if you were 65, what would the, uh, well, we'll call on the mayor over here since he's sitting there. He's probably not 65. But what if you took a 65-year-old who's living in your city, mm -hmm. um, what's the average age at which the 65-year-old will die? I would play, say, 75. 75. And I might as well pick on the other mayor here. Um, what do you expect the average age of death, the life expectancy of a child born in 2030 would be? 72. 72. Okay, so the chief is a little overestimating, but the others have, will come to, so if you're 65, the average man will live to be 83 and a half, the average woman to be about 86 and a half. So um, the older you are, the more you get, and um, Mayor Sellers will uh, talk about uh, the last answer as we get to the end. I have about an hour and a half loaded of slides, so I hope you're all ready to stay till 2 p.m. Um, but let me go over some of the data. And I'm a challenge for the photographer because I walk around a lot and ask questions. So um, the life expectancy in Russia from 1960 to 2004 actually went down by about a year. What caused that, Ben? Also, you're on lifestyle as far as... That's right. It's lifestyle. So, in fact, the USA, during that period of time, increased about one year more we were living for every five years that went by on the calendar because of medical treatments. But if the progress, and if the progress in the U.S. continues, the life expectancy in 2050 would be 85. But, in fact, we think it's going to be much greater than that. So I'm not supposed to, so the, the Cleveland Clinic, which is obviously the sponsor um, of me, should probably not want me to say this um, because I get in trouble all the time. But the average life expectancy voted at the aging research group that I'm a part of was that the average that they expect in 2050 is 130. Um, and I'll come to why that is and what some of the changes are that are going to bring it. Um, now, when I said this in 2004, I got ridiculed by the plain dealer um, in a front page story. 2006, I said it, I'm sorry. Um, but Time Magazine had it on uh, about a year ago, so it's okay to say it now. Um, but we declined for the first time last year um, only the second time since 1970, first time in this decade, um, our life expectancy went down two-tenths of a year last year because our lifestyle choices, what you said, overcame medical progress. That is, our ability to get chronic disease overcame it. And as I said, there's more than a 50-50 chance that the medical progress in aging because of the amount now spent on aging research may change your and my life expectancy radically. So when I said 130 at 2050, many people the age, in the aging community are betting that that's what will happen by 2024. So you've got a plan for retirement much more. So I don't know if there's a financial planning group in here, but you have a role. Um, and your quality of life may stay where it is and when that breakthrough occurs someplace between 2020 and 2030. I'm going to show you we have had that breakthrough in animal species in December. And if that's relevant to us, we don't know that yet, but if that is, this may occur really quickly. So, why are medical costs per employee rising? All of you are faced with that. Um, but the Cleveland Clinic's own medical costs are not, nor is about for 40 companies we work with. 
and I'm going to show you what has happened then. Can you slow your own aging? The answer is yes, and I'm going to show you some techniques to do that. And by, me, why? by 2024, as I've said, the aging researchers have bet it. Um, most are afraid to say it publicly. And what to do now to keep your brain functioning. Now that's about the hour and a half talk, so um, we're going to try and go quickly. So first we're going to say, why did the Cleveland Clinic start a Welling Institute, Wellness Institute when every other institution, academic institution that had done it had failed? And it's basically because of Toby Cosgrove's vision. And his vision is colored by the same curve that's on my bathroom mirror. This is the Congressional Budget Office estimate of the federal spending as a percent of GDP was done in 2010 right after Obamacare passed, and I'm going to show you what they said. They said that all non-health care, that's defense, uh, even disability spending in the federal budget would go down as a percent of GDP, assuming GDP went up at about two and a half percent a year as it had for the prior 70 years. This blip here is the baby boomer social security blip. So this includes social security and all the other entitlements. That goes down. Only one thing ruins American society, and that is health care costs. And this is Medicare, Medicaid, the federal programs for their own employees, for the military, etc. But if you look at their calculation, it takes in only three things. The aging of the population, that is that slope is due to aging, due to growth in capita, per capita spending due to new technology. And there's a little bit for Obamacare, if you will, or the ACA PPA. In fact, this was designed to slow the process. Remember, it had three goals, improve quality, improve access, and decrease cost. It did two of those, that is the quality I mean, it has had major effects in quality and access. It has not slowed the cost as much or to any great degree. But in fact, this is a gross underestimate because the major change in healthcare costs is not accounted for, which is actually the influx of chronic disease. And if you account for that, and most politicians won't even say anything about that. If you account for that, we have to double tax rates. In other words, the marginal tax bracket that's 39% has to go to 78% by 2024 for us to have the same budget deficit as we do now if we don't change the influx of chronic disease. Let me show you what I mean by the influx of chronic disease. All you have to do is look at type 2 diabetes. I'm 71, so when I started practicing in 1974, we had 2.2 million type 2 diabetics. Recently, we've had 29 million, a 14-fold increase with only a 50% increase in the population, or it's increasing seven times faster than the population. The prediction is it goes up another fourfold by 2050. It uses 15% of our total GDP, not 15% of the healthcare budget, if we treat it the same way we do now. We'd probably have to spend more because the people would have it would be older. If you look at hip and knee arthroplasty, we did 67,000 in the first year I was practicing anesthesia. We now do a little over a million. Again, a 14-fold increase with only a 50% increase in the population. The prediction is it goes up sixfold. And we don't want to stop those things. We want that treatment. And dementia care, again, a sixfold increase with only a 50% increase in the population. And the, if you will, the, the good news from a competitive standpoint is we've exported our bad habits. China now has more as a percent of the population. They have 607 million people with diabetes or prediabetes, um, an enormous number, if you will. They only treat, the reason we're more expensive, 
we treat about 50% of our type 2 diabetics, they're only treating 2% of them. So part of the reason, and obviously as you get a more developed society, you treat it more. The good news is there are four things that the CDC in analysis in 2007 and again in 2012 said cause 84% of all medical costs in the United States. And by the way, most of those occur in the under 65 population, your employees. That is, this is in the employed population. Um, we used to say you spend 50% in the last year of life. You don't. You now spend 15% in the last year of life. It isn't because we're spending less in the last year of life. It's because we're spending so much to get to the last year of life. But there are four things. Tobacco, food choices and portion size, physical inactivity, and unmanaged stress. Those are all under our control. So you can guess the reason Dr. Cosgrove started the Wellness Institute or that we started at the clinic was because he wanted to see could we motivate changes in these that would change the influx of chronic disease. What was happening? Well, the calories consumed in America increased 2% per year starting in 1984. We know exactly the month it started. The culture in the United States changed in September 2000, September 1983, at which point it was okay for all of us to eat anything anywhere, any place. The corner grocery store became the corner convenience store. Gas stations had food. I hope I'm not offending too many people here. Um, and it was okay to eat anything you wanted at Starbucks or McDonald's or any other place all the time. And so the, our citizens, we had eaten between 1858 irregular data, but always the same, till 1983, 2,370 calories, plus or minus 40 calories a day per adult in the United States. Starting then, we increased 2% per year, compounded annually, so we now, we got up to 400 calories more per person than we needed to maintain our weight per day in the US by 2000. We've actually done a little better. We're only at 250 to 350 extra calories per day now. Physical activity from 1990 to 2010, just in 20 years, went from 17% of Americans saying they do none to now 50% say they do none. It doesn't matter whether you're a woman or a man, doesn't matter whether you're employed or unemployed, doesn't matter whether you're Hispanic, black, Asian, etc. 50% of Americans say they do less than 10 minutes of walking any one day of the week. I do more than that giving the talk. Um, so in fact, um, this is the blue line is, 2000, is 1990. The black is 2010. That's people willing to say, I do less than 10 minutes of walking any one day of the week. The net result, our costs as an absolute percent of GDP went up 50% to around 17.6%. And the average body mass, which is a weight to height ratio, our heights don't change much. But we gain in America one and a quarter to one and a half pounds per person per year. So in fact, the average 65-year-old in Warrensville, if they're typical of the rest of America, weighs 25 pounds more than the average 65-year-old who, who was five feet seven 25, 18 years ago. That is, we're increasing by a pound and a quarter per person per year in America. Um, and that was what was happening at the Cleveland Clinic too. In fact, our costs were projected, we were spending $305 per member per month all in. That includes my salary, everybody else's salary in wellness, as well as all the administrative costs for the program, as well as the direct medical care, $305 per employee per month or roughly $4,000, a little less than $4,000 a year. This was the projected numbers. 
And if you looked at our trends, it was projected that we would spend $631 per member per month in 2016 at an additional cost of $400 million for our um, 40,000 employees and roughly 41,000 dependents in that era. It was unaffordable. You wouldn't have a medical school at South Point if that had occurred. You wouldn't have all the new programs and be able to afford, if you will, the Cleveland Clinic care. And that's what has occurred in America. These are real data on every employed person done by the Kaiser Foundation. It's roughly 130 million people. And you can see the out-of-pocket costs have tripled from 1,500 to 5,000. And the employer costs have gone from 4,000 to 12,500. It's actually a little over 13 this year. So in fact, the costs have tripled for medical care. Why? It's because of the influx of chronic disease. If you look at it, it isn't because we're paying Robert more money. Um, it's because there are more people demanding medical care services, needing medical care services because of the diabetes and the osteoarthritis and the dementia and three other chronic diseases. By the way, there are seven chronic diseases that use 100% of our GDP in 2050. If you do the projection, it doesn't work. That means we won't even have money for food. So in fact, it can't happen. What will happen? The same thing that's happened in the last 15 years. We get de facto rationing, which makes income inequality much worse. Let me show you that. The amount spent, in fact, for the last 15 years has gobbled up every dollar of income productivity gain. And who spends most? It is the lower income employee as a percent of their salary. More of it goes for medical costs than the higher income employee. So I have here medical expenses are a major cause of income inequality. That's an incorrect statement. Medical costs are 107% of the current problem with income inequality. It's more than 100%. Now what really matters though? We know if you do five behaviors, which I'll get to in a second, you have, if you're one of the nurses in the nurses health study over a 28 year period, a 90% reduction in chronic disease. If you're one of the younger nurses over that same 28 year period and you did those five behaviors, you have an 80% reduction. But only 4% of the people who should know best, our nurses, did that. Guys, don't look at askance just because most nurses are women, because guys do worse. In the Swedish men's study, it's only 1% did five. And in fact, if you look at, in the United States, in the Nihain study, it's a study of about 80,000 people every year surveyed across the United States. Guess what? Two point, I think it's seven percent of us did right by four of the things. That is, had a healthy diet based on four of ten criteria. It's not even all ten criteria for a Mediterranean diet. Did 30 minutes of physical activity five days a week, didn't smoke, only two points, and if you look at it in the group that's over 65, our Medicare, which we pay for as a society, as a group, it's 0.6%, less than 1%. That's the whole problem. In fact, in no population in the world have, does more than 12% do those healthy behaviors. We have exported Starbucks and McDonald's and every other bad behavior we have incredibly well across the world. That's why China has the diabetes. That's why India has it. That's why every country has it. We haven't changed the genes of the Indian population or the American population. We've changed our lifestyle. And that's what's causing us income inequality. That's what's causing us to go bankrupt. And Obama was absolutely right. If we don't focus on changing it, we as a society disintegrate. Because the key, though, is how do we get more people to do the five healthiest behaviors. I think that's the most important question in health today. How much is NIH or the federal government spending on that question? Zero. We don't 
motivate people well enough. If you look at populations where drugs are paid for, Medicaid care Part D recipients who get 100% of their hypertension drugs paid for, the veterans who get 100%, well, 25% of them don't take the blood pressure Medicaid. That's an underestimate. If you read through the article, it is 25% of Medicare Part D recipients don't even get the prescription filled. In the Veterans Administration, if you're a veteran and you have high blood pressure and I give you a prescription, the chance of your filling it is 60%. That is 40% in the VA where the drugs are absolutely free, don't even fill the prescription. And of the remaining 60% who take them in the VA, 50% stop taking them within two months. Um, now, that's a problem with the medical, it's not the people who get the drugs, it's us as physicians in not motivating people strongly enough to take them. So, Dr. Cosgrove said, the challenge of the Wellness Institute is can you change the health of a population and at what return on investment? Because every country and most every population has America's problem that as we eat too much expensive, in addicting food, we don't manage stress, and we do too little physical activity, and that's destroying all of our standard of living. So the Cleveland Clinic started this. We were on this red trajectory of costs, which I showed you. We then went to the green, and we've fallen off the green. Falling off is a good thing. It means we're spending less per person per year for care. In fact, if you look at it, we're spending 159 million less than the Mayo Clinic is for the same 101,000 people, or roughly the same 101,000 people. And instead of being at 305, and instead of going up like the projections were, and by the way, in 2012, when I tried to convince our chief financial officer that this number was different than this number, he wouldn't agree. But he has agreed that, we, that the programs are saving money now because in the last three years we've actually decreased per member per month costs, including all the incentive payments, including my salary and everybody else's. This is the total, um, if you will, in per employee uh, per uh, month cost. Um, and in fact, last year we spent $10 million less than the year before for our employee health care costs. How have we done it? Well, we've helped them, and I'm going to show you that briefly. We helped them decrease smoking rates 10% from 15.4 to 5.3%. The blood pressures have gotten lower on average. The hemoglobin A1C measure of type 2 diabetes has gotten much lower into the normal range. LDL cholesterols have gone down. Body mass index has gone down. So instead of people gaining weight at the Cleveland Clinic, they've actually lost about a pound and a half per year since we started the program or they're in fact getting thinner. The average Cleveland Clinic employee is getting thinner by about two and a half pounds compared to the average person in America. And immunization rates have gone up as well. So, how do you do it? What Toby Cosgrove, and, and by the way, I'm doing this because every firm can do it. So whether you're in the firehouse or the police station, or whether you're in the mayor's office, or whether you're running a video company, this is all doable by each of you. There's no secrets, I'm gonna tell you every secret. It's six things that everyone can do and that Cleveland Clinic does for its employees in South Park and you can do it in your business. So it's culture change first. Toby ma messages how important being healthy is to the energy you bring to work to your well-being, to your ability to live well with your family and not have disability. And he does it repeatedly. Every month when we have our connection, he rewards someone who's either gotten rid of stress or who's lost weight or who's quit tobacco or who's done one other thing that to get themselves healthy and he gives them a reward. And it's not hard to find the one or two people, it's hard to not find 20 or 30. Um, to do it. And then aha moments. 
if that fat slob can get thin, I can get thin. Um, and that's literally what it is. Now we do it with virtual visit. We can, we'll have it virtual on a phone so that anyone can do it, but it is that way. If I had more time, I'd show you a couple of those examples because we use them. When we went to Lafarge, they wanted to make examples. So we took union stewards. You can do this at Union, and union stewards who hadn't moved in years and were smoking, and we got them to volunteer and to show them that they could get healthy, and this was good for the employees. Knock down barriers and make it free. We reimburse smoking, re smoking 83 to 89% when you quit smoking, the smoking program. The day we made it first dollar free, we had four times as many people sign up that day as had signed up in four years, right? People expect things that are going to get them healthy to be free. Make it the easiest choice. You can't buy a fried piece of anything on the Cleveland Clinic campus because we took out all the fryers. Yeah, maybe you can bring your own fryer in and put it there. I don't think you can. You can't buy a sugar drink on the Cleveland Clinic campus. It wasn't because we said you can't have a Coke, but you have to bring it in. If you're going to get sick, you have to make an effort to get sick. We want to help you stay healthy. And then incent it big time. We incent it in a huge way. So more than half of Cleveland Clinic employees are still paying the insurance rates they paid in 2009. And that's part of this huge incentive. And add a buddy. So we added a buddy. And I'm going to skip some of the buddy slides just to say that we figured out how to do the buddy for all kinds of things, for hypertension, et cetera, because a buddy being socially responsible and accountable to someone else is a key component. And we figured out how to put it in the care pass. This is Lafarge, so we do it with them across the country. In fact, we do it across the world in 13 other countries with them. But this shows this is weight loss, and this small wedge is a tobacco program, and this one is a stress program, et cetera. So you can do all these programs, if you will, online with an email buddy coaching. It's not an automatic text, it's an email exchange with your coach, and it works really well. This is why Lafarge did it. The, they were the fourth largest cement company in the world, and their drivers were getting so fat that these rungs on the cement truck were breaking, and they were falling down and getting disabled or they were breaking the rungs. So they had to hire a guy, a kid, who sat over here who was thin and young to climb up the rungs, and so they, but they were also getting a lot of disability. In the first year, 43% of the Lafarge people who had type 2 diabetes got rid of it. Reverse their type 2 diabetes. And of their pre-65 retirees, 50.8% got rid of that. And in fact, a third of those came back to work. They stopped being retirees and started being workers again. This is what happened to Lafarge. This was Aetna's projection of where their medical costs were going to go based on the age of Lafarge employees. This is where they went. So instead of spending 79 million in 2014, they spent 41 million. What did they do with the rest of the money? They bought the number six ranked cement company. They were going to merge as equals. Lafarge became the dominant because they had saved so much money on their health care costs that they could afford to buy the other. So culture change first, aha moments, knock down barriers, make it the easiest choice, incent it big time, add a buddy. Whether that buddy is at work or a virtual buddy, you can add a buddy. And then I'm going to say the other thing is offer multiple programs that work. Um, as many of you know, since she tweets it out, we care for Oprah. Um, she does Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers works for 18% of our employees. And Curves works for seven. And our e-coaching for 30. But if you add them all together, we can get 70% of people to get to normal weight. You got to offer multiple programs. And the same thing for everything. It doesn't work to just offer one program because different people respond differently. It doesn't work to have just one buddy because, in fact, you may respond to a smackdown and he may respond to someone 
coaxing him to do better. But it is that if you get enough programs, you get success. So why are medical costs rising, but not for us or Lafarge or the 40 other companies we work with? It's because we've stopped the influx of chronic disease by those six processes. Can you slow your own aging? The answer is yes. So how old will you be when you die? Well, if you're in this room, the life expectancy for a 65 year old is 84 for men and 86 for women. And what will the life expectancy be at birth in 2030? The prediction from the aging researchers is someplace between 2020 and 2030, there'll be a major breakthrough that'll leave us to average being over 120. In fact, the prediction, I didn't even put it up there because I figured um, my public relations people from the Cleveland Clinic would cut my head off, um, but I'll say the number was 160 that got voted on. The reason is you get to control your genes. That is, just imagine, by the way, you got to save for retirement, obviously, if that's happening. Uh, no one's buying into this. Chief, help me here. Um, but um, all genes do is make proteins or watch other genes. And which genes are, of yours are on or not are under your control. So this is 52 guys with prostate cancer. they are 52 little if you will, squiggles representing the genes from each guy. That's what they look like. And this is called the heat map, because when they're red, those genes are on. So you see these 52 guys with prostate cancer, strips, there are 52 strips here. They're largely red in this bottom half. And a year later, after an intervention, they became green. What were these five genes, by the way, that they went from on to off with? Those are the RAS family of genes that cause the growth of prostate, breast, or colon cancer. We could do the same thing with 480 women with breast cancer. It is exactly the same. You get to turn on and off those genes. What was the intervention? Well, you probably know it. The three guys who smoked quit smoking. They eliminated five foods from their diet. They walked 10,000 steps a day, and they meditated as their stress management program five minutes morning and night. That's all it took. Lifestyle changes to turn off the genes that stimulate the cancers to grow. And by the way, what did they do up here where they were off and turned them on? These two genes that they did that with produced the GSTM1 protein, which caused prostate, colon, and breast cancer cells to commit suicide. So they turned off the genes that promote the cancers. They turned on the genes that promote the death of the cancers. And in fact, 11 years later, only three of the 52 have required more than lifestyle changes for their cancer as opposed to 29 in the control group, which didn't do these changes. Here's a patient with left anterior descending artery problem. So that is where white is on this. This is a coronary angiogram, and that's where blood is flowing. And you see it's narrowed there in what's called the LAD, or the Widowmaker artery. This guy got turned down for a coronary artery bypass at Hopkins. He came to the Cleveland Clinic, and he got turned down at us, too, in 1996. Why? Because if you don't have normal vessels, and he had lousy vessels, it's a plumbing problem. You need a normal vessel to put the bypass into. He didn't. And so he said to his doc, Dr. Esselstyn, what am I to do, die? And no, as he said, you can change your diet, you can walk 10,000 steps a day, you can meditate, and if you smoke, you can quit smoking. Guy's still alive today, but here's his angiogram two and a half years later. Same machine, Siemens x-ray machine, same magnification, no medicines, because they weren't around or popular in that era. All he did was lifestyle changes. And in fact, 98% of coronary artery disease can be reversed this way if you look at the studies. Yeah, 2% of us have genes that don't allow us to do it, but the vast majority, coronary artery disease is a lifestyle change. So how do you prevent brain dysfunction? I'm probably, uh, I hope I'm, I'm going to take another 
uh, 15 minutes, but I'm going to whip through this, uh, Steve, if that's okay. Um, so manage stress, why? Your um, memory center of the brain is your hippocampus, um, which is here, all memory goes through there. And what happens, these are the hippocampal neurons, when you develop dementia, they shrink. There's only one organ in the body where size matters, and it's your hippocampus. Uh, so you want a bigger hippocampus. We remember that, Chief? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Hippocampus. Um, only place size matters. Um, so um, these, as you see, shrink. And at the same time, this woman, over a six-month period, developed dementia. Um, sad. But can you build this up? And the answer is yes, because what knocks it down this is a normal neuron, and this is from a rat's hippocampus. The rats remember the same way through their hippocampus. And you notice how many branches it has. Those are the connections that we think are important for memory. When you get stressed, you prune those. It's like pruning a tree. You prune the arborization, and that's what makes the hippocampus get smaller. Stress does that, blocking stress, reverses that. So most important thing, by far, in your workforce, if I was going to say, do one thing with your workers, it's teach them how to manage stress. We have a great program to do that, but there are lots of great programs. Um, so blood pressure control, cigarette cessation, stress, these are some of the biggest ones. Blood pressure control up to 25 years younger. Um, cigarette cessation, 8 to 12 years younger. Um, stress control, 32 years younger, patrolling your own health, that is seeing docs, getting uh, your care updated, eight years younger, quality of sex for women, quantity for men, 16 years younger, <laughs> nutritional choices. <laughs> I kept you awake, okay. Nutritional choices, 27. But the point is stress is bigger than anything. It is the largest cause of aging, and that you can easily reverse. It's literally five minutes of meditation morning and night. So we talked about that. Second is do the four components of physical activity. For someone playing basketball, there may be 40 components of physical activity. I can't even count. Um, but remember I told you about the hippocampus and size matters? This is the hippocampus on, in another study, looked at from a side view, and you see how it gets bigger. Physical activity, just walking, increases the size of your hippocampus about 2% over a three month period. So these are people who were totally inactive in a senior home, they got them to walk, and on average their hippocampus improved, increased in size 2% over that three month period, as opposed to the average person at home declining 0.6% over that period. You can increase the size of your hippocampus. Stress management number one, two is uh, physical activity. I'm going to skip over these from a time standpoint other than to tell you walking gives you more than 50% of all benefit of physical activity. Resistance activity should be next. Third is cardio and fourth is jumping. You want to prevent breaking a hip. It is jumping 40 times is all you have to do. If you looked at the Dr. Oz show, um, he and I had a challenge on who could do more jump ropes. I killed him. They, in fact, had to go to commercial. I was beating him so badly. Um, but in fact, um, anyone, you can do it with your grandkids. It's a great thing. Jump rope. If you don't want to jump rope, you need to jump on a hard surface. Before you get a back injury or a hip injury, it's the one exercise we know that aggregates mass to your bones. This is the data, whether it's diabetes or ischemic heart disease, breast cancer, colon cancer, doing the four components reduce your risk by about 40%, 30 to 40%, with only physical activity. That's not even including tobacco cessation, not including stress management, not including food. You get 30% less of those diseases just by doing physical activity. Um, I've got a new book coming out um, with Gene Chatsky, who's the finance editor of the Today Show. It's called uh, Age Proof, Living Longer Without Running Out of Money or Breaking a Hip. The secret on not breaking a hip is the jumping. 
I've told you that's the whole chapter on not breaking a hip. Okay. It's not really, but <laughs> um, if you pre-order it, I'd appreciate it. Um, it com <laughs> comes out February 28th. Um, anyway, um, do speed of processing games. There's one game that changes your rate of dementia by 50%, 48%. So there are two cars here. One of them will appear there. And there's a Phillips or Route 66 sign here, not all of the rest of the places. You have to identify where, which car and where the thing is. So you click here if it's one car or the other. And you click in the quadrant. And it gets shorter and shorter as you get it right, longer and longer as you get it wrong. It's the only game in randomized control trials that makes a difference over 10 years in dementia. All you need is two hours of practicing for five weeks in month one, two hours, two weeks in month 11, two hours um, in month 35. So it's 18 hours over a 10 year period. It decreased dementia rates by 48%. I don't know, 48%. It's an amazing thing. It started with 73 year olds. So Mayor, if I was gonna do one thing at your senior centers, it would be put this game on computers. Um, but it also decreased injury auto accidents. When I've practiced this game, so for your drivers, um, what happens is you get much better at seeing things from the side that you never thought existed from the side. Um, so that's the, uh, if you will, called speed of processing games. Memory games don't do it. Um, cognitive games like playing crossword puzzle, et cetera, don't do it. Reasoning games don't do it. Only speed of processing games decrease dementia. We can talk about the neuroscience of that if you want, but there is a reason for it. Eat salmon, ocean trout, or 900 milligrams of DHA. DHA is the component of fish oil you want. All the other components of fish oil throw out. Um, and I'm going to skip over red meat and why you don't want to have red meat or egg yolks or cheese. Um, just from a time standpoint, um, do I have enough time? Steve, should I go through it? It's four extra minutes. Okay, so I'll go back over that. So what happens with red meat is the bacteria love carnitine lecithin and choline. They don't give a damn about whether it tastes good or not, your bacteria. They just want the carbohydrate, hydrogen, and oxygen in these three things. So they take that and they love it. And they metabolize it to something called trimethylamine or butylbutane. That goes to your liver, which produces trimethylamine oxide, which causes inflammation in you. So what caused the problem? It wasn't the fat. It was these proteins, or amino acids, carnitine, lecithin, and choline, in the red meat, or in the cheese, or in the egg yolks. So let me show it to you here. So what happens is those get into the bacteria. They produce trimethylamine. That causes atherosclerosis and kidney failure. It's probably the largest cause of kidney failure in America. It is the largest cause we think of atherosclerosis. Now you'd say, well, why don't I just put in something that blocks the liver from doing this to this? We did that to seven volunteers from Case Graduate School, and what happened? It was safe but no one would associate with them because they smelled like dead fish. <laughs> Trimethylamine, I mean, literally all we did was do this for seven days and for 30 days no one would come near them because they smelled like dead fish for a while. No one's laughing even, <laughs> but that's what happened. So what happens when you get to a level of trimethylamine that's in normal, you more than double your risk of coronary artery disease. It's a worse risk factor than is hypertension. So you say, well, is there a way of stopping it? Yeah. So this is the way that Stan Hazen from the Cleveland Clinic, who's the lead researcher in this area, and he found to do it. He said he wanted his steak and ability to eat it too. And so he tried all kinds of things and found this one compound, DMB. Where's DMB? It's in 
extra virgin olive oil from California, from Spain, from Greece and Turkey. You notice I didn't mention Italian. Italian extra virgin olive oil is polluted and doesn't have it. But the other countries do. If you have three tablespoons of this, roughly 650 calories of extra virgin olive oil, you block the production in the bacteria of trimethylamine. They don't care about the trimethylamine, it's their poop. They care about the carbon, the hydrogen, and the oxygen, and they do fine without it. So, can you do it? Well, we'll end up with that in something else, but right now the only thing you have in it is extra virgin olive oil and you'd eat a third of your calories from that three tablespoons a day. Don't do that. Um, just avoid the red meat. Um, but in two or three years, we'll find something else or this in concentrated form that does it so you'll be able to have a steak or egg yolks or cheese and enjoy it. Okay, um, I wanna get to, um, I'm skipping over snake oil foods because there are some food changes but we don't have enough time to go in and avoid toxins. Take the Fab 8, there are eight supplements. I'm gonna tell you they're on our website. I, I don't have time to go through them but I wanna go through the next thing in aging. So why do people think of aging as going to actually radically change in your lifetime? If you're planning on living to 2024, or certainly by 2030, the betting of aging researchers is your life expectancy is going to change radically. And that's because there are 14 areas of hot research. I'm going to show you two of them that have are able for you to change. Now some like mitochondria errors and wear and tear, we all reduce. That's what fish oil does. That's what some of the other supplements do. That's what changing the food does. That's what avoiding tobacco does. Maybe even stress management. But the key is having a great repair system. So if you have stem cells and blood flow, you repair things. So let's say you get a sunburn or a heartburn. Why do you not form a scab? Because you have blood flow to the skin unless you've got a third degree burn. That is the normal burn is what we call first or second degree. It turns red or it gets, but your blood flow stays the same. And most people who get those sunburns are young enough. They have pluripotent stem cells that rush in but you're wasting your poorest potent stem cells if you get a sunburn. Or if you have heartburn. You see that guy on TV telling you to take Prilosec. Don't take a comedian's word for medical advice, please. Um, he doesn't understand because your heartburn, when you have continued heartburn, even if you take Prilosec for it, it causes the same problem in your esophagus and your stem cells have to rush in and repair that. If you have a heart attack, why do you want to get to the Cleveland Clinic or even Metro or University Hospital fast? And by the way, people don't realize how lucky they are in this community. We have three world-class facilities or three world-class institutions. And yes, I do believe um, ours is the best. Um, I used to, um, when Mehmet and I would debate a point, I would say, well, I'm right because I've got the data. Um, nobody's laughing, but anyway, um, I, Cleveland Clinic is, is absolute, but you want to get to a facility fast because they restore blood flow. If you've then got pluripotent stem cells, they rush in and repair your heart so you have normal function, normal contractile function as it squeezes blood out so it provides you and you get back and can function. Even if you've had a blockage, you can get, if you get it there fast, same thing with your brain. Your stem cells rush in and repair it. So you don't want to waste your stem cells on sunburn or heartburn or anything else. And we, our stem cells are currently limited. We have a thing on the end of them called telomeres and that telomere gets one base pair shorter every time you use another stem cell. Only has so many duplications to make more stem cells. So what's the key? Figuring out how to make more of your own stem cells, right? Because you will be able to repair everything. Liver injury, send my stem cells in. Brain, send my stem cells in. And that's what's happening. So 
This was an accident that happened in, at USC in Dr. Longo's lab where he had some uh, animals, two different species, mice and guinea pigs, on food restriction. We know if you restrict your food to about 70% maintaining normal weight, so a little less, you get really thin, you live about 30% longer. But an accident happened. Instead of keeping them on calorie restriction, the environmental service worker who was in charge of feeding fed them after five days. And guess what? They not only lived longer, but they started to repair things because they regenerated their stem cells during the refeeding port of that process. So how do you do it? So it's now been done in three studies in humans. So it's not widespread. We, I, don't, I haven't told you anything that isn't four studies in humans that you can do major analysis on. This, I'm, this and the next thing are cutting edge, if you will, less than four studies. So 1,000 calories the first day, followed by four 750 calorie days, then Mediterranean diet. How do you do 750 calorie days? You get a tomato soup. 28 ounces of diced tomatoes, 28 ounces of water. Um, eight ounces, I do it all the time, eight, once a month I do it. Eight ounces of uh, corn niblets, um, eight ounces of water, as much uh, onions as I can tolerate, and then spices, change it. You, by the end of the fourth day, you get really tired of the tomato soup, but you can have 17 portions a day without going over 750 calories. So you stay there, you get tired of the tomato soup, as I said, but it works. It reduces the biomarkers of aging, and it regenerates stem cell telomeres. Um, we're in, so that's one of the two things I wanted to tell you, secrets of the breakthroughs. That actually is being used in humans, and maybe. If you take 30 linear steps, you go 30 meters or 30 yards, meaning that's how much I do. But if you take 30 exponential steps, you go 26 times around the Earth. That's where we were in computers in the 90s and still are. That's where we are in aging research. We're leapfrogging things incredibly fast. And so, in fact, I told you about this, the maybe increasing stem cells, but also changing which genes are on. We don't know how to change genes in you very effectively yet, but we know a lot about changing which genes of yours are on. So you saw that with the guys with prostate cancer or women with breast cancer doing those four lifestyle changes changes the RAS genes and change the GSTM1 genes. But this is a study that just came out. I'm showing it to you. It's December 15, 2016. And this is what happened. These old, they looked at the, what happened with the genes of these mice. And you see, they, as they got old, they developed damage to the DNA that controlled the genes. It wasn't the genes, but it was the DNA that turned those genes on or off, started dysfunctioning. And they said, could we revert them to no damage? And they took these four genes, which you all have, that allow you to regenerate stem cells, and they turned them on by changing the drinking water of the mice in a very specific way, or injections in some. And what happened? They regenerated the DNA so it had much less damage. Then they took these old mice and did the same thing with these four genes, and they made them younger mice. They lived 50% longer. And then they did it, these are specific mice that age, and then they did it with old wild type mice, and their organs became much younger. And they function as though they were much younger. Imagine you in your tea or drinking water have something that does that. That's how simple it may be if you look at the mice study. That's how fast things are going in aging. By the way, you need the right amount of these. That is the right amount of that stuff in the drinking water. When they gave too much, 
they regenerated the cells so much that they turned into cancer and those mice died early. So this is about one third that amount is what they found they had to use. So where are we? Um, by the way, we may be able to change your genes and edit your genes too. That's what's now being done in animals with something called CRISPR. So aging, why are medical costs, where have we been? Why are medical costs per employee rising but not for Cleveland Clinic, Lafarge, or about 40 other companies? Because they do those six processes that we can teach them or you've now learned how to do that you can do for your own employees to get younger. Can you slow your own aging? Absolutely. And by 2024, no one's willing to say it, but you may get, be able to get much younger. Thank you.